चरित्र मान जरा विधवा हो प्रेम कर she mother figure of the party she my lord of the party not the one who sings it was horrible it was right not the one who sings my lord is it mother may to be goddess she will take to go so you can have a mother figure you can have a goddess like figure ever either to be jab represent court so when you are representing a woman in a text or worship So the mother figure is worship, but again, you need to build it. What kind of a mother? She can't be just a lazy demise. So marriage first, conception next, birth of child or children, following something which is very very institutionalized. Because even the people are telling their words, the very comes to one feminine function, it is almost impossible to perform. In picture, without restraints, that is not a good. So, if you think of a person like, say, Mr. Prem, that is, if you grant for the devil as a sinner. So, if you, are, on the one hand, you are talking about the maternal instinct, but when the instincts are really rampant, then you grant her as a sinner. If it is not legitimate, so as we can have no. Idealization. So you have the mother figure as K.K. Rukmini says. You have the mother figure. You have the Madonna-like figure. You have the wise woman from the mountains. So the era of idealists. On the other hand, you have the witch, or you have a pocket that we both can say, but it's used sometimes in feminist texts. The witch woman or the witch woman, the fallen woman. Think as well. About fallen woman, she can manage the other one. That person is denigrated. So either you have idealization or you have denigration. So there was a total split. So when uh, Sivanti Vibha actually analyzed these five authors, what was she doing? She was approaching male authors from the feminist perspective. Usually, even women readers, some of the women readers, even women readers are sometimes. Expected to read as men. This was taken up more in age-related sexual politics. I should look at a text from my perspective. So if I am a woman, there should also be a woman's perspective. So when you have this practice of approaching male authors from a feminist perspective, it came to be known as phallocentric criticism. The phallus being the side of power. So phallocentric. You can call it phallocentric. You can call it androcentric. But yes, Patricia Moore refers to this as phallocentric criticism. And more so because later on you have gyno criticism. Gyno gyno criticism, which was popularized by Eric Schumann. So phallocentric criticism, right? So the critics sought to expose the masculine bias of the world in question. Right. So representation of female characters, the second sex, patterns of female subordination in the works of five male authors. Here is another text, Mary Elman. This was thinking about women, 1968. Somewhat witty, but a very scathing analysis of of the ways women are represented in literature by men. So the women were actually thinking of these issues. 
how are women represented if there are no women writers? How are women represented in the works of the male authors? So here was what Simon de Beauvoir and then of course see Mary Ellen. But very soon followed sexual politics. Sexual politics is about power relations between the sexes. The question is can you use the word politics when it comes to relationships between sexes? Sexual politics. When you talk about sexuality, sex or sexuality. Sex or sexuality, we know. Or sex and sexuality, as we know, are related to biology and physiology. So the question is how does politics come? Kate Miller says that when you refer to politics, you don't refer to parties or chairpersons or meetings. It's more than that. So when she says politics, Kate Miller says that we are we should think of the power relationships between the sexes. Max Weber refers to it as war shaft. So you have dominance and you have subordinates. Dominance by the men and the subordinates of the woman or women. So she speaks about the power relationships between the sexes and Carly analyzes. Again, she analyzes male authors. She begins with Henry Miller. What does Henry Miller have? Henry Miller refers to a seduction. So once again, the man shows that he can seduce. And he can take a woman anywhere he wants. Then you have Norman Miller. The killing of the wife and the sodomizing of the maid. After that comes the, the after that comes Lee Florence. Then of course in her analysis comes George Henry, the French guy. Who refers to homosexuals, pimps, queens, queens. So, there you go. So, analyzes the words of male authors, but she also theorizes how men will subordinate women. So, prior to feminist criticism, this is what the critics say female readers have been habitually forced to read as men. Every female reader also had to read as a man. This is what Kate Miller also mentions. The text I was talking about, Henry Miller. It represents seduction in a bathtub. Seduction in a bathtub. It means that whenever a man exercises his rights, sex may occur. The question is how would a woman feel? The woman would feel used, the woman would feel like an object. But the men? And another question, who would be the target audience in this case? It's obviously men. So not only are you stereotyping women, you're also targeting only male readers. So what about the rest of the populace? Right. So this is how it all began. So from the late 1960s, you have a spate of diverse feminist criticism. Diverse feminist criticism, very often of a political nature, and current sex, it shows, uh, it shows no sign of abating. So this is on the rise. So more and more women are writing, more they have more and more feminist critics. They are activists, and of course there is a total re-evaluation. A re reading of the texts. Show that example. If you read a text like, say, Death of a Salesman. Death of a Salesman is a modern tragedy, blah, blah, blah. You can discuss all that. It's a modern tragedy because it deals with Logan or the low man who, unlike a mighty hero, also is crushed by something which is akin to fate. So societal pressure crushes the tragic hero, the law. The question is if you read Death of a Salesman, if we read Death of a Salesman, should we or should we not also think about Linda Roman along with Linda? So this is how we 
also keep on re-reading the texts. If Willie Logan is important, Linda Logan is also important. Not just as Willie Logan's wife, but Linda Logan should also be re-read, analyzed, critiqued. So this is precisely what these women do that do. Right. So much of it, much of the criticism was often political. The 60s was an age in which uh, all these activists actually began to critique literature. So often it was political, very often it expressed anger. It When you are dealing with feminist criticism or when you are uh, part of a genre which is which is uh, which has something to do with say Dalit literature. It's very often the literature of protest. Very often, and we we should not we cannot disagree. So feminist criticism, Dalit criticism, whatever it is, or feminist writings, Dalit writings, very often they take the form of protest. So here again, you have anger, you have a sense of injustice. All these women, women kept on expressing. So, injustice and of course exploitation by the men. And a substantial amount of feminist criticism actually goes beyond it. So, just as Kate Willett had talked about sexual politics, and she went on to categorize all the ways in which I mean, relationships could also be politicized. So, she begins with. The ideological concepts, biological concepts. Uh, she talks about class, she talks about force, she talks about anthropology. So, where is literature? Literature is related to each and every aspect. In fact, you have shifted from history to women's studies. You were there in women's studies, but what are you studying your undergrad thesis? No graduation thesis. Very good. Eventually what happens, there are certain things that keep on overlapping. You cannot study literature without studying history or social history. You cannot dissociate literature from sociology. You cannot dissociate literature also from economics. Look back in anger. Unless I mention Jimmy Porter's class, I cannot do it. So the voting of the Labour Party into power, Jimmy Porter being a man who is from the working class, but with a but with a BA degree or BS, whatever, but with a graduation degree, he wants to get into mainstream society and he finds it. Every IQ is closed. It could be the same about women. And the question is, are women or should women? called minority. Numbers actually prove nothing. Think of how politicians refer to the minorities. At the person Parsis, two person Parsis, yes, we say they are minorities. What do you say about women? Fifty percent of the populace, what is the status there? So the number proves up. That is why there was so much of anger. That here was this body, which made 50% of the populace, but you see the exploitations continue and the injustice continue, and for ages. So you have The Mad Woman in the Attic, which was published in 1979, The Woman Writer and 19th Century Imagination. This was a monumental study, absolutely delightful. So it is about the motives and patterns in the words of 19th century women writers. So the women writers were, as I said, re-read, re -validated. So, this is what brings us to my topic today. Today I will be on. So, such analysis, we spoke about phallocentric criticism. When you are not critiquing women writers and their works, you have women represented in the works of male writers. 
So that was phallocentric. So here you have gynocris. And it was Elaine Showalter who actually popularized the term. So she says that it is criticism concerned with writings by women and that included letters and journals. Actually, all, uh, now that you all are research scholars, if you actually have to critique a certain author, you have to look at the letters that he or she has written. Journal entries, these are very important. So, criticism concerned with the writings of you. They could also be letters, they could also be journals. And all aspects of production and interpretation. Again, when you are saying production and, and reproduction, Obviously, you'll understand, you have understood already, that there is a Marxist angle to it also. So, production and also interpretation. So, phallocentric criticism, what did phallocentric criticism do? Phallocentric criticism opened up the, literary, the whole literary canon to a new and revolutionary field of analysis, right, or criticism. So, that also exposed the sexual politics. And that also paid way for psychoanalysis. And then, of course, we should also tell ourselves that it did little to address the lack of women in the town. How many women are this? Troy Madame Lewis, very recently when we were conversing, I asked her, and I, I have also asked, you know, faculty members in other universities. And in the departments of sociology, not sociology, the literature and human studies, how many women writers do you have in the universities? So the question is should we go on with reading only new texts? Or the long span that we have given to what we are doing. So far, so good. Are we including women writers also in the syllabus? So these are things that, yes, the wonderful faculty members that you have, they keep on thinking about these things. Why do they keep on thinking about these things? Because these are important. Why only concern ourselves with fellow centric criticism? criticism is a must. We must read the works by women writers. We must read the works of women writers and reanalyze them. So, this was gyno criticism. Gyno criticism. This was the first book that she brought out. A literature of their own concerned with writings by women. Let us go. Yes, it worked to increase. Look, it's like. So yes, uh, criticism concerned with writings by women, I said all that, letters and journals. It worked to increase the number of female authors available to readers. You put the chai chuli to pacho. The shopkeeper tells you the, at, at the bookshop, oh this book, this has never been reprinted. This happens. So whenever you ask for a book by should be called the Mandela writers, they get a Mandela. So you see, these texts were available, not available to readers. The question is how many texts were written by women to come to that? And the question is if texts were written by women at all, why did they disappear? How did they disappear? And was there any politics behind that? अग्निहोत्री <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying. 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 I
ভালো বলো খারাপ বলো So, Barbara King, who's writing about uh, J.S. Uh, says, she states, writing about issues outside the world, supposedly under discussion, was a common feature of 19th century reading. So, when you are discussing a male author, you are talking about, uh, you know, the intellectual view, influences, uh, symbolism, all the kinds of analysis that we did in our undergraduate case. When it's a whole writer, you are simply looking at whether it has been initiated from something else. We are both so different. So, she says, writing about issues outside the world, supposedly under discussion, was a common feature of 19th century. Reading. So, it is not surprising that the practice was applied to the approach of the so the women were talking, and only the women. So little thought was given to questions related to women writers or women's literature in state politics and it's a literary imitation. So yes, they were imitating some of them, they were imitating well, but there was no women's writing. That was the idea. But anyway, we should still applaud this man because he was addressing the issue. He was acknowledging the fact that women were, yes, women were actually writing. Okay, so little thought was given to quest, uh, questions as well. So what was the what was the protest against? As Barbara Kane says, there was an amount of misogyny. Some sort of hatred, some sort of misogyny. Then of course comes J. S. Mill. So this is how Ellen Walter begins her first chapter. Stating that the English women writers have never suffered from a lack of reading audience. She said, no, women did write and people did read them. You cannot just do away with an entire body of work. So, Ellen Shobatu was the first, Shobatu was the first to state that. She says, one needs to find out what unites them as women. So, if you are talking about a woman's body of writing, you also need to know about what made them better. How did they write? Why did they write? Under what circumstances did they write? And then of course comes J.S. Mill writing about female creativity. So this is what he said in the subjection of women. Women would have a hard struggle to overcome the influence of the male literary tradition. This we cannot do. Even if you critique uh, you know, writers like Sylvia Plath. Because Sylvia Plath also when she went to Cambridge, she loved, she said that she loved Shakespeare. She said she loved P.S. Eliot, she said she loved all those, you know, uh, major new doctors. But then again, if you keep on critiquing Sylvia Plath, you'll find that her writings, in a way, also resemble those of Virginia Woolf. Certain things that Virginia Woolf has stated about women authors, they repeat what she also says in Ramadhi. They are part of the construct. So, uh, he says women would have a hard struggle to overcome the influence of male literary tradition and to create original, primary, and independent art. If we agree to this, we must analyze why. Why would they be unable to create art which was independent? Why did another pretty call this kind of writing a literature politician? Were there certain flaws in them? Or was it because of circumstances? Mill said if women's literature is destined to have a different collective character from that of men, much longer time is necessary than has elapsed before it can emancipate itself from the influence of accepted models and guide itself by its own impulses. So, blame them or praise them, both of them were actually looking forward to women's autonomous self-expression. Maybe they were these two men were not to blame at all. They were saying, stating what was true. So what were they saying? Women, please do not imitate. Women, Please express yourselves. So 
So both these critics. So let us not condemn them. Because after all, they did speak about women's rights, they did acknowledge the women's variety, so they want them. Autonomous. Self expression. So, right. From 1880 to 1910, British and American writers, many of them, explored female utopia. Actually, I have a student who now teaches at Bombay since eight years who has worked on women's utopia. So, 1880 to 1910, I was a new So, what did they do? They offered types from a male world. With a culture opposed to the male tradition. But again, show what this is. This. She says they were usually pastoral sanctuaries where a population of pre lapsarian leaves cultivate their organic gardens, cure water pollution, and run exemplary child care centers. Well, undisturbed by men, they cultivate organic gardens, they cure water pollution, run exemplary child care centers. But she wanted to say, but they do not write books. Not Exceptions are true. If you think of the child of little women. Little women with four sisters, but one was right. Joe. Joe. Joe was the right. Meg was a typical, uh, the stereotypical woman. Now, I'm an artist, but Amy. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Amy was an artist. Meg uh, was, was the and she was not only by those standards. She wanted to uh, remain beautiful. She fell in love, wanted to get married, wanted to have children. Make was the studio right woman. But of course, you had Joe, you had Amy. One was aspiring to be an artist. And Joe was a writer. In the exception, but what is show what the same? Show what the says that they were showing these pastoral sanctuaries with pre-lapsed beliefs, but they were not writing books. They do not write books. They were in Shobhi stereotypes. The lady novelist, not just the woman who was a philanthropist, but also the lady novelist, she was the composite of many stereotypes. The lady novelist. We have our word for a Japanese. But look at this. Here is a woman writing. Here are two women discussing uh, probably something uh, important. So over an intellectual discussion, there is a man supervising or probably a heartedly listening. Look at the trash over here. There's a there's a dustbin. And there are children, dirty, scraggy, snot nosed. So, this is the stereotype. Here is another stereotype. Actually, this, I, I, I have a feeling that this is a representation of what was it? That, that woman who appears in Bleak House. Lady, this is Mrs. Jellyby. This is Jenny Y in the house was a woman who was kind-hearted and she was a philanthropist and she would write letters because she was concerned about concerned about what? Children suffering in Africa. A man like Dickens, whom we all loved and worshipped in childhood. Not that you should not read it. But yes, Dick, Dickens also parodied her. What was the idea? The bottom of Africa She's so concerned. She's so concerned about what happens to children in Africa. And look at her own children. So you know, come on, who is that? It's not most. So dirty, scraggy, see? 
unkempt hair, unwashed hair, uncombed hair, all of them. So this is a stereotype. So if a woman does this, this is how the household will do. This is what will happen to her children. So here was a woman who was thinking about children in Africa. But her own children were roaming around like this. So this was the stereotype. Are it the stereotype teach you? A creature with eight halfway upper fingers. Constant, as if she does nothing but kind. With ink halfway up her fingers. Okay. Dirty shawls, you can see them. Dirty shawls, frowsy hair. Not just frowsy, but also dirty, unkempt, unwashed. And then uh, these stereotypes were created by Jane Ludlow. And to 20th century critics, it was worse. Here, of course, she was surrounded with children who were unkept. But the 20th century also showed the lady novelist as one who was childless. Which means if you are writing, but again, you see, I just spoke of Sylvia Plath minutes back. Uh, Sylvia Plath's uh, character in the Whale Jar. Sylvia Plath's character in the sense it was a semi-autobiographical case. So she represents herself partially as Esther Greenwood. So Esther Greenwood is shown to have a boyfriend who is a medical student. So he takes her to the medical school one day and they watch a fetus in formality and they also watch childbirth. And the boyfriend says once you have a baby, you won't need to do all this. What was his do all this? She was a writer. She was aspiring to be a writer. So you see, the idea was that if you channel your creativity to writing, either the children get neglected or you don't have children at all. So child is a new rocket. So these also came up. The stereotypes of the lady novelist. So either she was like this, or she was absolutely childless. I mean, absolutely neurotic. So, Schoenberg now gives us reasons as to why such discussions have been inaccurate, fragmented ones. Women's literary history has suffered from an extreme form of residual great traditionalism says who? John Cross. Residual great traditionalism. So this has reduced and condensed the extraordinary range and, and diversity. Two, four or five great writers. To have four or five great writers but you show them as tokens and you do not encourage other women to write. This is very typical of India also. Think of what is happening in the past few days. People are constantly projecting this lady named Draupadi Gopi. Tokenism. She is important, definitely. Hers is definitely the voice of the subaltern, which has not been silenced. But simultaneously, people should also think of all women, not all women, of all girl children, and make it a point. They should ensure that all women, all sorry, all girls, should have at least secondary education. So we are highlighting one person, but we are forgetting the mass. This is a very good example. So you have five to uh, four to five great writers. Jane Austen, these are the Bronte sisters, George Eliot, Virginia Woolf. But what about other writers? They have been left out of anthologies. So 
the project they wrote culture bonds stereotypes of femininity here clash between biological and aesthetic training that is why i gave you the example of silvia plath not plath but of course i still be good at her quality but if you have a child you would need to write that is here so in the victorian period the women novelists had outgrown the constraint that they go and from the late 1960s you have the re-emergence of not just women's liberation but also a renewed enthusiasm for the idea that a special female self-awareness emerges through literature in every period so do not limit yourselves to only these women this is what diocritics say so words of Dozens of women writers have been rescued. This is the best part. This is what Dino critics did. They kept on rescuing the works which had been published but which had gone to oblivion. So they have been rescued from what Thompson calls an enormous condescension of posterity. But you see, all this also proves that women have had a literature of their own all along. The name of the book was a literature of their own. Women's literature, a literature of their own. So this proves a point. They did have a literature. It may have been forgotten. But yes, they did have a literature of their own. Right, where am I? The female literary tradition. So next, Joe Walter talks about the literary tradition and the development of the literary subculture. So she says one should not look at women as sociological chameleons, taking on class, lifestyle and culture of the male relatives. Again, you see there was always this comparison. But women should be looked upon as beings with a subculture within the framework of a larger society. Unified by values, unified by conventions, unified by experiences, unified by media. And unfortunately, she says, every generation of women writer, of every generation of women writers, has found itself without a history. Because there was a documentation. So these writers could not relate themselves to women's history or women, the history of women's writing. And they had to rediscover the past of fish, forging yet again the consciousness of the sex. So, what were the questions? Why women began to write for money? Did they write for money? Surely they did. Why should you think of a woman writer as an unprofessional person who writes only to satisfy herself? Like the male writers, they were also writing for money. So why women began to write for money? This is the first question that comes up when she talks about the literary subculture. Tarko, if you how they negotiated the activity of writing within their families. Were they encouraged? Were they discouraged? Because you see, women had a lot to do in those days. Cooking, cleaning, washing, definitely with the help of servants. And if you were ordinary middle class, you would not have service. What else did they have to do? Make shirts for their brothers, petticoats for themselves, shirts for their brothers if they were unmarried, shirts for their husbands and children if they were married. So with so much of time given to the household, the question is, were they encouraged to write or they not encouraged at all? So how they negotiated the activity of writing within them? So if the men did not encourage, what would they do? They would write, write, write. So if somebody came in, they would just leave the piece of writing under something. If they did not give a lot, that you would always do. So how they negotiated the activity? Next question. What was their professional self-image? How was the word received? What effects did criticism have upon them? 
What were their experiences as women? How were these reflected in their books? You see, they had limited exposure. So what experiences did they write about? What were their experiences as women? There were certain areas they could not enter. For example, in the Victorian period, you could not have a woman working in an office as These were before corporate jobs, but of course there were clerical jobs. A woman would not be a clerk. So, could she really write about the clerk? If not, I can forget the year of my years. If she wanted to write about the clerk, would she be able to write about the clerk? Because she would not be able to enter a very Right. So, what were their experiences? How were they, uh, how were they uh, represented? What was their understanding of womanhood? What were their relationships to other women, to other men, to their readers? You all know about uh, what is it called? You all know about. Uh, Wolfgang Iser and, and his talk about the target audience in reader response theory. So you have men like uh, Wolfgang Iser, you have men like Stanley Fish, you have Julia Kristeva, there are as many texts and there are readers. The question is who was their target audience? Were they also writing only for women? Were they writing also for men? Were the writing uh, I mean what, what which readers were they talking about this? How did changes in women's status affect their lives and careers? How did the vocation of writing itself change the women who committed themselves to it? Eva Reader the subculture with specific periods. So she analyzed very the literary subcultures and she also included black, Jewish, Canadian, Anglo-Indian, American, along with British writers. So it was a very comprehensive study. First phase with the also the first phase was the feminine phase, 1840s to the 18th. To 1880. First, she says there is a prolonged phase of inhibition. So you see, you cannot blame GHDs. You begin by imitating. You begin by imitating. This is how you learn. So, a phase of imitation of the prevailing models of the dominant tradition. And then you have the internalization of the standards to art and its views on social goals. So the first phase indeed was a phase of innovation. Internalization of the standards of art. Whose standards? Obviously the dominant group. So the male standards. 1840s to 1880s, sorry, I said 1940s. So 1840s to 1880, a phase of innovation. Which means U.S. Lewis was not really wrong. Show all the sense that this is how they began. But of course, if you have to learn something good, you might as well begin with imitation. So Showalter also says that from the 40s to 1880, this was the imitation. Then 1880 to 1920, the feminist phase. Feminine and feminist. 1880 to 1920, a phase of protest. Protest against the standards and values and advocacy of minority rights and values, including a demand for autonomy. So you see, if we go back, we cannot really blame Lewis. Lewis and J.S. Mill, they simply pointed out that you see women were writing literature for religion. And they should write, an, uh, they should uh, seek an autonomous voice. They should write as autonomous beings. Follow? So after 40 years, Show all the sets. The then came a phase of protest, advocacy of minority rights and values. Again, surprising, isn't it? The women were referring to themselves as minority. 
They are not blatantly stating it. But you don't have to be blatant. Minority rights and values, including the demand for autonomy. Then comes the female phase, 1920 to 1960. So first you have imitation, then you have protest, then you have self discovery Autonomy is not free from some of the dependency of opposition and the search for identity. Interesting. So we begin with this phase of self-discovery and search. Schumacher also adds that these categories are not limited at all. Remember your school mathematics, remember the Venn diagrams. There are always certain phases which are overlapping. So, the women did not really uh, have discussions amongst themselves and say that, well, 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 we have reached, we have uh, addressed a feminine phase. From today, we will begin with the feminist phase. No, it doesn't happen. Only in retrospect we understand that yes, this is how the social changes took place, this is how the traditions took place, this is how you know, there was a change in values. So yes, these are overlapping phases of feminine, feminist, female. Cynthia Ozick refers to the female subculture as custodian. A set of opinions, prejudices, tastes and values prescribed for a subordinate group to perpetuate its subordination but also as a striver, as a thriving and positive entity. So, this is Cynthia Ose, also a writer, but then you also have, uh, this is what I found in the writings of an American historian. Nancy Koch says we can view women's group consciousness as a subculture uniquely divided against itself by ties to the dominant culture. So there was no denying that. Ties to the dominant culture. While the ties to the dominant culture are the informing and restrictive ones, they provoke within the subculture certain strengths as well as weaknesses, Enduring values as well as affirmations. This was Nancy Cott. Not a feminist critic, but a feminist historian. So, a subculture uniquely is divided against itself by ties to the dominant culture. So, it is impossible to say that uh, when exactly women began to write fiction. Uh, show what the says that it would roughly be sometime after celebrity. So, you have the middle class ideology of the proper sphere of womanhood. That is why such bizarre uh, you know, parodies. So, you have the ideology of the proper sphere of womanhood. And in post industrial England and the United States, this ideology projected what? The angel in the house, a perfect lady. An angel in the house, this is very close to the Indian concept of the Griha Lakshmi. You see, you are actually uh, describing the woman in terms of the goddess. So fit to be worshipped, worthy to be worshipped. So the perfect angel in the house, this was the studio. A perfect lady, an angel in the house, Contentedly submissive to him. Not only submissive, but contentedly, right? Like. Strong in purity, religiosity, queen in her own realm of the house. That's a big joke. But this is a blatant lie with which women have been brainwashed over centuries. You are the queen in the house. I'm sure the brain for a show. I'm sure you've read a girl's house. Whenever there's a when there's a crisis and when she asserts, Nora. she finds, Nora finds that she's a child among her own children. Status of all the children. 
She was no different than her own children, with an infantile dependence on her husband. Her husband who followed, very chivalrous. Because of his chivalry, what did the husband say? I, I mean, he kept on saying, I wish I could do something for you. Do what? Protect. Mm -hmm. Amon protection. You lose your voice. Amon protection that you will let people go into. You will let people So the queen of the house, the queen in her own realm. This was also a But anyway, this was a stereotype. So the first of these professional activities So the first prof of these professional activities as social reformers, nurses, governesses or novelists they were either home based or extensions of the family as teacher, helper, mother for women in England, says Walter, the female subculture came first through a shared and increasingly secretive and ritualized physical experience. Women writers were united in their roles as doctors, wives, mothers. By the internalized doctrines of evangelism and by legal and economic constraints of mobility, one could not be more as we do now. The women novelists' awareness of each other and the female audience showed covert solidarity. And this is what Mrs. Sarah Ellis said. Camaraderie between women was like a binding force of a minority experience. Again, you see, she refers to herself as a minority. So, few English women advocated the use of writing fiction as related. So, you see, if you think of these phases, the second one was a phase of protest. So Fanny Ford was doing this in the United States. So through literature they said we should protest. As we have. Because it's almost an hour. We're a little tired. So we will take that. <laughs> 